I tip my hat to anyone who tries to carve out a niche in the modern science fiction wargaming space. It makes me think of the fighters who dared to step in the ring with Mike Tyson during his prime. It's been decades now, and there's only been one dominant property with many challengers who've tried and failed to break off a piece of that market and turn a profit. Today I'm going to talk about Firefight, Mantic's answer to Warhammer 40k. Will it rise to the challenge, or will it end up just another body on the pile? Promo blurb time, Firefight is set in and around the vast galactic co-prosperity sphere. It's an immersive and exciting game of futuristic battles fought on alien worlds. Now, Mantic Games has done a pretty good job of existing alongside the Giant Games Workshop. Their name is well known in gaming spaces. They have several successful lines of models in many popular games. They've recently released their second edition of Firefight, which is their squadron-level combat game. These books were sent to me to review. I've read them cover to cover, and I've watched a few battle reports online. I actually left my house and got out into the daylight and went to my friendly local game store to play. Apologies to the Durham Cryptid Hunting Society, but you should know that the real pig man probably doesn't drive a CRV. And thank you for the trank dart. <laughs> really took the edge off. I got over to Atomic Empire in Durham. It's a very good store. They use foam table extenders. I've got terrain mats and lots of terrain to use. I brought my crusty old marines that I painted 15 years ago. My opponent brought their orcs. Now we managed to get a couple of games in. The first one, we completely botched the rules, and that became apparent pretty soon. So we got a second quick one in, and the second one was fun. But my opponent had a lot of units of brawlers. These are the orcs that need to get into close combat, and that unfortunately made them a little predictable. So I managed to eke out a minor victory just by putting as much of my force in one spot behind cover and then concentrating my fire on anything that got too close to me. By the way, guys, if you're going to send me a game that has proprietary dice, such as the Command Dice in this game, Firefight, maybe send me some of those as well. I'm not going to drop $15 for dice on a game I may never play again to, to make a video that only makes $5 in AdSense revenue. I've got to get this video out quick while this game is new, so I can't wait for dice in the mail in either case. We just used a couple of D4s instead, and it seemed to work out okay. Fundamentally, Firefight is not very different from a modern 40k. If that's a game you play, it's going to seem very familiar to you. I'd say if you've played any war game in this type in the last 35 years, nothing here is really going to blow your mind. There are seven different factions with humanity at the center. You pay points for your armies. There's organizational restrictions. There are reserves, infiltrators. Units have stat lines that are very similar to those in 40k. There are different scenarios to play, and those different scenarios have different deployment zones. So instead of just walking you through fairly common knowledge of what a war game is, I'm just going to cover what Firefight does differently from 40k, and if I think that difference is poggers or sussy. Am I doing this right? Enough framing, let's get into the book. So we're shown the Firefight stat line for units pretty early on, and there's two big differences from Warhammer 40k. There's sass and manhood. Sass measures how sassy a unit is, and Manhood measures how... Oh, you know what? Sorry, that's my war game. Sorry, I'm working on that one. Uh, sorry, the two differences are height and armor. Firefight uses a height stat for units and terrain instead of a true line of sight. Firefight didn't innovate height mechanics. Heroclix has had a similar height mechanic for the last 10 years. Basically, every unit has a height number. Typically, that number is 2, and they can see over terrain that's shorter than them. That would be terrain 1, the terrain that's only level one is considered an obstacle so it's something most units can go over with little effort to get onto higher terrain they can see over things it works exactly as you'd expect it to now at first glance height mechanic might seem like a little bit of extra bookkeeping but it's very intuitive the strength of it is that since everything is quantified you can avoid the arguments that rise up from using true line of sight if you play in a game store you've probably seen this or maybe you've even taken part in such arguments yourself i certainly have 40k's true line of sight frames itself as kind of an immersive and common sense but it's really a weird abstract action to begin with, essentially asking you to get down to the level of your models and see if you can see a model across the table, but not if you can only see that model's weapon, that's not good enough, and then you kind of get into how much of that model you can see, or how many of the models of that unit you can see. In reality, that model you're looking at, unless it's a certain kind of zombie or robot, is going to be hunched down, making the most of the cover he has available, and not striking whatever dramatic pose the sculptor chose to put him in. It's not like the lore says that 40k's universe is populated by floating, heroically posed mannequins or anything, right? I just, true line of sight, I don't think that's the best. I I think I'm more into this sort of height mechanic because in Firefight, you can draw a line of fire with a tape measure and make note of that line crosses over any terrain. And if it does, you compare the height of the firing model to the height of the terrain. And from there, you determine if a unit's in cover. 
The next difference in the stat line is that the armor save and toughness stat have been combined into a single stat called armor, which represents how hard something is to kill. And that means shooting in firefight is resolved in only two steps instead of Warhammer's three. The first step is rolling to hit. Every game with projectile weapons has this. Determining how effective a volley of fire is using dice and factoring in the marksmanship of the attacker and how hard the target is to hit. The second step is rolling for damage. Most of the time in Firefight, you're just rolling against your target's raw armor stat, but some weapons have armor piercing, and that reduces the target's armor by the armor piercing value of that weapon. If you roll over your target's armor, they take a wound, and if that's their last wound, they are killed and taken off the board. This cuts out 40k's redundant armor saves, which not only speeds up play, but makes a lot of sense. The 40k armor saves were a holdover from Warhammer Fantasy. Armor in Warhammer Fantasy was uniform across all the different factions. There was light armor, light armor with a shield, heavy armor, heavy armor with a shield, and then it went up to mounted and mounted with barding, and that all sort of scaled up, so there was this independent armor system. Now, the reason you had that is because you would take that armor system and then you would apply it to vastly different races, from halflings and goblins all the way up to ogres and chaos demons. So, in that case, a toughness system being separate from an armor system makes some sense. But in a science fiction game, the idea of armor becomes so abstracted, there really isn't any reason not to just roll it all into a single stat of damage resistance. I mean, robots don't wear armor, they are armor. And why would any two races have force fields that have you know similar stats that work the same way? It just, there's no sense in it. I also really like the way Firefight handles movement. Everything in Firefight is oriented on the unit leader. The unit leader moves up to his movement value, and then the rest of the unit moves into coherency around him. And that's an elegant time saver. Another difference is that Firefight has alternating turns. This isn't the only war game that does so, but I prefer it. It keeps players engaged, as your next opportunity to move and fire is always just moments away, and the order you activate your units in offers another level of strategy. You can spend command points in order to move two units in a row, and this gives you even more options. It also makes it less likely that you'll have a unit blown off the field before it gets a chance to act if you lose initiative. The your entire army axe and then my entire army axe model doesn't really feel like the active exchange of fire and assaults you'd see on a real battlefield. I swear the only reason Games Workshop keeps using this is out of sheer stubbornness. Get over yourselves, GW. Alternating activations is better in every way. Firefight also uses a D8 system instead of a D6 system, and that means small modifiers like plus one to your attack rolls when charging, or negative one to them when shooting at a target that's in cover, doesn't mean quite as much, and whether that's good or bad probably depends on your personal taste. It didn't feel like a significant difference to me, but at this point in my life neither would Nuclear Winter. There are a couple of different kinds of actions your units can take in Firefight that I don't believe are in current editions of 40k, but may have existed in some former and other and older editions. The first is called Blaze Away. Effectively, a unit can lay down suppressive fire in order to attempt to pin down an enemy unit. The second is called Hit the Dirt, and that allows a unit that's out in the open to make use of what cover there is on the ground. They basically get down and hide behind rocks and stuff. And this costs an action, but it does give them a cover bonus. I guess I should explain pinning was sort of a thing in earlier editions of 40k, basically triggered by big destructive weapons or heavy fire or losing an assault. Basically, they're suppressed, and they take some penalties when they activate. The very first thing they have to do is sacrifice one of their actions to become unpinned. And in Firefight, you get two actions per unit, per activation. All of these things are gold to me. I, I love having tactical options. I like the strategic depth this stuff offers. I've always hated how regular soldiers in 40k could just casually run into fields of fire from horrific alien weapons. For example, like the Necron Goss Flare guns, which peel your flesh back one molecule layer at a time. I and mean, in modern combat today, soldiers take cover. They stay behind cover if there's fire coming in. They don't charge. That, that crap went out during the Civil War. I mean, that's why the casualties in the Civil War are still kind of unmatched. We figured out that you keep your soldiers alive by not putting them in the fields of fire, but somehow, you know, 40,000 years in the future, just soldiers running into horrific weapons. Anyway, Firefight has that does not have that as much. One of my favorite squadron level tabletop war games is Stargrunt 2, which is probably too crunchy for most people, but it has a great treatment of suppressive fire and digging into rain to really sort of represent what firefights are kind of actually like. And, and I love that little bit of detail, you know, when you move the game out of the Magic the Gathering to the war game simulation, when you move in that direction, that excites me. And Firefight is definitely a little closer to that 
than 40k. Firefight also resolves close combat a little bit differently than 40k, and 40k, once a unit gets stuck in the close combat, it either wins the combat and makes a small movement after, or it loses and it has to make a morale check. And if it fails that check, it takes additional casualties by how much uh, it failed that check. I, I think this is an abstraction, which I think is supposed to represent individuals fleeing from combat. In older editions of 40k, the whole unit would attempt to flee, and if they failed morale check, now the other unit would attempt to pursue, and if it caught them, then it would destroy them. But, but in any edition, once a unit got locked into hand-to-hand, -hand, that was kind of it. Because unlike shootouts, close combat is supposed to be very decisive. In 40k, there are some rare units that could simply extract themselves from a losing combat. In Firefight, that's the standard. Every time a unit loses an assault, they're moved back six inches. Now, they are considered activated after that, and they are pinned, which means when they get activated next, they, they lose an action. So there is a significant penalty for losing a combat, and it does put that unit on the back foot. The next thing that pops out at me is that most factions get drones in Firefight. In 40k, that's just a Tau thing, but here, uh, the Enforcers, Firefight's version of Space Marines can get robotic dogs, their Space Dwarves can get bomb robots. They're essentially an upgrade to the unit, and it gives them some additional abilities, so if you really like Tau drones... Uh, here you get them with every faction. I don't know. Just sort of a selling point for some people, I'm sure. After you get through the rule crunch, you kind of get a lot of missions. I mean, there's a good selection of missions in the back of the book, and some of them have a nice narrative element, which I find fun. There's one where you raid science labs and you might unleash monsters, or you might find advanced weaponry you get to use for the rest of the battle, so that's cool. There's one where you're having tectonic activity, and so there's lava and earthquakes and stuff. So, lots of fun stuff like that. You do get a modest amount of fluff at the end of the setting, which is fine. It didn't really grab me. It's, it's sort of a generic setting, which is good. It's sort of perfect for making your own narrative campaigns. Basically, all the factions can ally except for one, the, which is the Plague. I can't really see how that one would be allying with anybody. As far as having a, a map campaign or something with this fluff, it's very doable. It's really quite good for that. It's not like 40k where everybody sort of hates everybody else it seems like for the most part conflicts are similar to the conflicts on earth where they're not the rule they're just sort of you know things can flare up and then you have battles anyway i'm rambling first impression i love this game the stuff that they've kept that's similar to 40k i think is good and i also like the things that they've tweaked a lot another reason i love this is all the rules you need for all seven factions comes packed in one book and i'm talking about that book today i will do a review of that book as a separate video where I'll get into the models. Unlike 40k, there's no endless codexes, there's no issues of White Dwarf you need to buy, there's no rules blow. We'll be talking about that book soon. Guys, if you enjoy this channel, please consider donating to my GoFundMe, joining my Patreon, check out my eBay store. Got lots of nice miniatures on there and comic books and what have you. Please leave a comment, please like, subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any videos, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.